Hello and welcome to the Touchstones Tapes, the podcast where you can explore, discover and keep connected with us as a museum while we're closed for redevelopment. I'm recording this intro at home because Katie and Brian, you are both in the collection store where all the action's happening. What's going on guys? Hi Rick, um, there's two of us in the collection store today, there's me and there's also Brian. Hello Brian. Hello, hi Rick, hi Katie. Um, it's a sunny day today, even though we can't see it because we're in a windowless building. Yeah, but- it's always good to um, spend probably the only nice day of the year stuck inside (laughs) with no access to the sun um but that's okay because today we have a lovely sunny guest we have the brilliant erica matthews who runs creative health rochdale and she is a ray of sunshine um and she's going to be telling us about all the amazing work she does with her community interest company um and she creates opportunities for older and mostly socially isolated people to come together and get creative to improve their well-being and erica works across rochdale borough and with a number of groups and also touchstones is home to one of these um creative art groups um with the really popular weekly sessions where people can get creative and improve their health and well-being Yep, the Wednesday Art Club is so hugely popular, so I think we'll probably have a few people who've come along to those sessions who are really interested to hear what Erica's got to say. Um, I'm very excited to chat to Erica and for you all to hear this brilliant conversation. Let's get cracking. So we've all heard of the words creative and the word health, um, but today we're going to be talking about the joined up approach of these two words, creative health. With this episode today, we'll be speaking to the amazing woman behind um, an organisation which is actually called Creative Health, and that is Erica Matthews, who is a community artist and also the director and founder um, of the organisation. Hello, Erica. How are you today? Hello, Brian. And hi, Katie, as well. Hi, Brian. Hi, Erica. Hi, Katie. Um I understand you've you've been in the store before, the collection store. I have, I have. I came and had a look round. We were doing some, we did some live drawing and as part of that we decided to use objects from the collection as part of that. I think it was around the time of the Football Art Prize. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I love it here. It's amazing. Really, I mean, it's the size. It's like a TARDIS, you know. It's just it doesn't stop, and uh, you like you go in one room and it's full of crammed full of like the most amazing things, and then you go in another room and that's crammed full of amazing things. But the bit that got me was the area where you have like the furnishings and the and there's like lots of knickknacks from from the past and uh, I sort of had this wave of nostalgia for my um, my nana lived in Cheshire and she had this big old council house on Northwich Road and she had this massive larder and in there there were all of these like utensils and weird little metal things that looked there were you know when you're a kid you like playing with them and messing about with them and and there's loads of those in the collection so it was a really nice sort of like you know maybe feel like I was six (laughs) it was really good and the other bit was they were old uh, my dad was a fisherman and they used to trawl things up so he'd trawl up old medicine bottles and sort of um, uh, things that had been dropped over the side of boats and there's quite a few of those as well so it was very nostalgic so I, I love it I could I could quite happily live in the uh, the collections room if I'm completely honest what does it smell like Erica uh, smells like a uh, smell <laughs> 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 dust <laughs> <laughs> my my nana's larder well my grandma yes I called her she she had actual old food in there but it was just like really old tins so it had quite a unique smell <laughs> i'm just thinking about that smell now <laughs> joe's you know, funny i remember she my nana i don't know where she got it from she had this block of crystallized sugar that was and it, i know and the thing is is you know i'm going i was there the whole of my life you know i can remember it from being a small child to being a teenager and when i think now i'm like i don't really understand how she lived as long as she did <laughs> <laughs> terrible antique sugar antique sugar nice yeah yeah poor old nana but yeah it was lovely i did i do but i i didn't seem the the only thing with the collections is is 
is it's difficult because there's so much. So you kind of like, oh, 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 and you know, you're constantly seeing something. So I, th- I think if I got my way, I would spend a good year. But then I do like, I've just had two weeks off work and the second week I did spend it going around museums and galleries and, and drawing. So that's what I like doing. I like going to places and, and drawing things. So the collection for me is the perfect opportunity to um, nerd out about art, really. Yeah, and I can see you've uh, selected a piece of art from the collection. I have. Yeah. Can I you have. tell us about that? I've, I actually it? went for a painting uh, rather than an objet. Um, I went for... Uh, <laughs> I went for Brian Wood's uh, The Rainbow, which, uh, because I'm from Cornwall, and I was going to, because you have got some stuff from the Newland School of Art, and I'm from Penn, well, I'm from Senham, which is near Land's End. Um, So I was going to go for something, you know, and, and harp on about that. But when I saw Brian Wood's picture, I was like, oh, no, that's exactly how I see the world, the way that guy paints it's and and it's a really clever painting it's really and it's and if it's around it feels like it's Rochdale and if you think about when it was painted if he painted I was thinking what if he painted it now you know how different would it be um but it's a it's just a gorgeous painting and the way he paints faces and people it's it really sings to me that I i if I'm in a doodle mood, faces is where I go. So to me, it really, it really reminded me of, of what I enjoy about art. So, yeah. yeah, it's gorgeous. It is a gorgeous piece. Could you describe it? So, yeah, sure. So it, it's a street scene um, and it's sort of like he set this scene of uh, a crowd of people and there are a couple of main characters so you've got um, a lady with a gorgeous green jacket on and very blonde hair and then you've got this really far out looking dude who looks like he's from a 80s dance video and he's got like these blue sunglasses on and he's doing some kind of wiggly dance in the background and then there's a guy with the most gorgeously big nose and when I draw I always draw big nose I love it I love a big nose (laughs) I think they're very underrated. Charles Dance. I was watching The Sandman last night. We were like, that man, he has got quite a noise. (laughs) So, uh, yeah. That's character. He does. It really does. I'm a sucker for a big nose. So, um, yeah. And and also, in the background, so the sky is very Rochdale. So it's that, I mean, what freaked me out when I moved from the south to the north is because we're so high up and you get very low clouds so you've got a a sort of grey fluffiness and he captures that really well and then in the background between the two buildings you can and it's interesting that he called it the rainbow because you can hardly see the rainbow it's Mm. really kind of well hidden but when you look at the colours he's used to to do the painting there's actually a, a lot of rainbow you know the on one of the buildings, there's a row of windows and there's people looking out of the windows. But the way he's created the windows, he's used all sorts of different colours to get that, uh, the reflection. Uh, it's, it's just a really interesting piece, I I think, and it, it really does. I love the yellow as well. It's got that uh, okra, which sort of blended into everything and it contrasts really well with the black um, and the darkness of the people. You feel like it's just stopped raining. You know, you can really feel what he's trying to capture. So, yeah, I love that painting. I would like that, please. (laughs) So, like, obviously your passion for art, like, just it's it's just oozing out of you. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was just wondering, like, with creative health, what does that mean? And, like, what, what is it that you do? And how does that work to sort of improve people's lives? Oh, that's an excellent question, Katie. So um, creative health was actually uh, after... um, I've always done art, so I've never, you know, not a professional artist. I was actually worked in a very corporate world um, before 
uh, I dropped out, man. Um, I cannot imagine that. I, I know. <laughs> and to be fair, I think I was very much a square peg in a round hole when I think back. But um, after Jacob was born, my son was born, um, well, the wheels came off a little bit. So Jacob had a disability and uh, I lost the plot for a little bit. And I was really struggling with, you know, and a I tried, gone to the doctors, went down the usual path, but I just didn't seem to be making any headway. Um, I was in a, I was in a very bad place. In fact, when I, I was thinking about that this morning, I was thinking it's weird that I don't recognise. You know, when I think back to how how poorly I was, I don't really recognise that anymore. It's sort of it's gone, and I. Um, went to London so I had I got this thing called agoraphobia which you know you struggle to leave the house it was quite it was quite bad but I told myself off I started eating differently I started making myself leave the house just for like half an hour then an hour and building it up and building it up and in like November of 2018 my sister bullied me mercilessly into going to London to see the Frida Kahlo uh, Making Herself Up mm. exhibition at the V&A. And I'm, I was like, because I'm not rich. Josephine, my sister, she's a textile uh, artist and I was like oh, all right then you're both very different types of we artists we are aren't very you? different I've met her. yeah oh yeah you <laughs> met Jo yeah. and she Josephine sold it to me by saying we'll go to the V&A and I'm like all right then because she knows me I love V&A is like my spiritual center and um we went to the Frida Kahlo exhibition and I was I mean the clothes and the dresses and it's all yeah fantastic and what not but the thing that i took away from it i was i had no idea i knew she'd been poorly i knew she had polio but i didn't realize she'd been in the car crash and i didn't realize she was left with such debilitating injuries from that and the pain she must have been in because at the time pain management you were either in pain or absolutely whacked off your head so you know the it was very different obviously medical reg regiment and she used art to get through the hard times because she was in bed a lot of the time. She couldn't, so she used to paint a lot from her bed. And in the Catholic tradition in South America, they have these things called votives. I mean, all over, but very much so in South America. And um, it's where you create a painting of trauma or something that's you know, challenging you. And then you take it and offer it at the church. And, and Frida Kahlo had made loads of these and they actually had some from just ordinary people, not necessarily artists. And it really sort of made me go, hmm, because I've always been like doing landscapes. I, I was always very classical art you know i was i was that's how i was trained you know you, you see something you draw it and da, da 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 i'd never really experimented i was quite 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 dull really in terms <laughs> of my art but something triggered me and i just i thought well actually i'm going to try that i'm going to try drawing which i never do i'm a painter I'm, i don't really draw and on the coach back to rochdale i started drawing and i kid you not i didn't stop for about six months i just drew and drew and drew and drew and in the end i i got it to whenever i was feeling because you know you have moments of anxiety or you have overwhelming feelings or whatever it is i would just grab a pencil i would start doodling and i got it to a point after 10 or 15 minutes i felt in control and happy and about and everything was fine and i thought you know and that was that and then weirdly i got a call out of the blue through a sort of like mutual acquaintance could i do an art session with some people who have got a cancer diagnosis and i was like well i've never done anything like this i'm not an art therapist and she's like we don't care we just want you so i was like yeah okay and i've been there ever since <laughs> <laughs> So I go back every week. I've done it every week for like, apart from the lockdown where we went online, but we, you know, I've been working with them now for four or five years. Um, and it was amazing because you were going in and doing art and each week you would see the incredible difference it made to people's lives. And I almost went in with a cynicism that maybe it's just me that this would you know maybe I, it's just because i'm doing it for myself that it works but actually it isn't it it works with everybody and 
And it's funny because some weeks people would be chat, 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 chat. And then other weeks people would be quiet and they'd just be doing their art and they were in this like f fluid state. You could see they were in this zone of concentrate, but they were really happy. And then everyone would leave. And, and so one week um, I was speaking to a lady who is in her 70s she has her own house she has transport uh she has children she has grandchildren and from the outside you'd think you know everything's great in terms of like socialization and she disclosed to the group that this group was the only time she left the house for socializing you know in the week and i was like what because she was really gregarious, really charming, you know, always had stuff to talk about. So it's the assumption that I made that all of these people were just sort of here. And then, because there were quite a few people aged over 60, we went around the room and there was, everyone repeated the same stories, more or less. And I was like, oh my gosh. I came home that night and I, I googled Rochdale social isolation. And the thing that came up with is, was the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment of Rochdale Borough-wide, uh, Rochdale Council, and I read it. And and in that document, that the council strategy is that Rochdale has got issues with social isolation for people aged over sixty. And at the time, I was starting to think about maybe being a professional artist trying to sell art. But to be honest with you, it's too. <laughs> it's not for me i'm not in it's just too much of a beauty contest and i'm not very good at um i know i'm chatting now but i'm not very good at, at selling you know and to be an artist i think you have to kind of have have a bit of a hook and I, I just can't be bothered so i thought actually in terms of what i can do for a job i could do art sessions with people i could reduce social isolation and i'll give that a go so i remember the first session it was in this tight in this really cold <laughs> it was freezing cold it was october there was no heating we were absolutely freezing and there was like three of us and then a couple of weeks later there were five of us and then we moved venue and then there were like 20 and now we're doing well we're going to be doing five or six groups a week across rochdale by the end of the year so it's grown and grown and grown so and people do seem to respond positively to the opportunity to you know have a play and have a chat and and get out and so yeah that's kind of that's kind of like my origin story not as interesting as spider-man's i'll warrant but <laughs> <laughs> you're a real superhero oh. yeah. <clears throat> not all heroes wear capes yeah <clears throat> They are amazing sessions, though, because I know you run you run one of the groups at Touchstones, don't you? Yeah. And that and you make them. I know you make them as free or as accessible as possible for those oh, yeah. who need it. Yeah. Um, but I know you've talked about like the origins of Creative Health, but like how you know you said there's more groups now. How did that expand? And just because we're massively oversubscribed, so with the Touchstones on the Wednesday. I mean, we 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 get on average, you know, between 25 and 30 people a week. Um, but even then, we could probably fill that again. Um, can confirm from a marketing point of view. Like, it's, it's um, you know, you can't, you can't put on enough sessions, I think, for people. That's it. And, and in terms of the... I would, one of the issues is with social isolation is that find, there are barriers to, to socialization, whether it's transport or finance or health or it can be or all of the above. That's one of the issues. So I think with the groups, making them free to me is is very important you there are local groups and you you know people pay three pound five pound and on the face of it that doesn't sound like a lot of money but actually when you're making decisions about whether to eat or whether to put the heating on three pounds on an art class is a frippery that people are just not going to be able to afford so it's it's very i mean there will be times where maybe we do stuff that's that people want to pay for in fact some of the guys who come to the groups are like you should charge uh, but uh, wherever i can then then i won't because i do i think especially with older people i think they've paid enough to be honest with you as well there's that element of it you know you spend your whole life sort of putting in and it's it's time to give something back so uh, there's that element to it and then i think the other thing is is that the groups is we aren't uh, i try not to make it too 
it's not about making a finished piece so it's always about the process i i'm not in i'm not interested and now the groups aren't interested in what it looks like really it's how the process makes them feel and and for me personally i think with sometimes when you people talk about their, the first thing people do when they come to the groups is they will tell you the horror stories of art teachers. You know, when I was at school, we weren't allowed to do this. When I was at school, we weren't allowed to do that. My art teacher ripped my artwork up in front of me. I mean, some of the things that people tell you, you're just like, oh, my Lord. So I'm really uh, keen to underscore that what we're trying to do is, is get people to fall in love with the process and not worry about the final piece because if you fall in love with the process, you will get confident. If you get confident, you'll fall more in love with the process. And in the end, you can't not but create pieces of work that reflect who you are. I think that's the other thing is I'm not into saying, oh, you have to do this or do that or do the other we i draw like erica you're going to draw like katie if i try to say no you're doing that wrong katie you need to draw like erica you can't draw like me i can't draw like my you know people always say we always talk about michelangelo or da vinci and people like that and we say you know da vinci used to burn lots of his artwork that he didn't want people to see because it wasn't up to scratch so he was able to keep this mythology going that he's this fantastically I mean, don't get me wrong he was fantastically amazing <laughs> he's all right he's all right but I, what i mean is he, he he didn't show you the workings out and and i think that's key is that when you people go to galleries and they go to museum and they look at these insanely amazing fantastic works of art you just see that thing you don't see what's happening in the background you don't see the years and hours and months of preparation of getting it wrong of screaming the house down you know you, you don't see the pain i know it's a cliche but you don't see the the mm. suffering artists you don't see that and and you know we i was saying about like the ateliers that they before the people were allowed to when they were at the schools they people weren't allowed to paint until the masters were 100 percent sure they could draw and for sometimes some of these students they it was like four or five years before they picked up a paintbrush mm -hmm. so it's it's also managing people's expectations about how long it takes to be able to do something with confidence and skillfully and not to worry about it because if you're enjoying it it doesn't matter how long it takes because the bit point is is you're enjoying it does that you know what i mean yeah, yeah <laughs> i can i no. can I, well, I mean i i'm not i don't consider myself like artistic and i had a very similar experience in in school with art teachers in that what i was doing wasn't what they wanted me to do but now i found my creative outlet which isn't mega creative i do like counted cross stitch and i absolutely oh, yeah. love it because it's just like you just get into the zone and I, I noticed that a lot of people my age were picking up these craft things during during the pandemic mm. because it was a way of um being mindful and and creating something and it didn't have to be that you had to be putting all your emotions down on, into something because sometimes that is that is hard for people so yeah. i think just that process and having someone there like yourself to guide them mm. um it, it's just invaluable really and I, I think the work you're doing to kind of break down that thing of doing things right doing things the right way and yeah yeah it's it's really great to get rid of oh, that yeah lovely what's been really lovely as well is the um, some people from the groups you've worked with have shown work in the galleries as yeah. well. And like going back to that thing you were saying about seeing, you know, um, masters works in galleries and people feeling like they're not, you know, they can't, they can never be like that or aspire to be like that. But it's really important to show and celebrate the diversity of creativity because it's not like you were saying, it's not just one thing. There's lots of different ways of being creative, isn't there? Absolutely. And I, I, I agree. I've, I, one of the things that I do bang on about in the sessions is this demystification, really, of, of art as a, you know, when you go to a gallery, because it's in a frame and it's on a gallery wall, everyone goes, wow. If you put it in a charity shop, <laughs> and stick a 50p sticker on why does it lose its value and and i and for me that's a really important sort of 
theme to get across to people that just because something is in a space and it's being viewed doesn't give it any more i mean it does but it doesn't as well give it any more it's not as important or less important obviously you're going to get cultural significance and and i think it's important very important in fact that we do have art is part of the cultural movement and we use it to get messages across about how you know how what's happening in in our communities or in the, wherever our network is or whatever we feel we represent i do think that's incredibly important the bit that i sort of go meh is the value that's given to one piece or another i think it can be you know it's i think i mean i do like i like a bit of art history and i like a bit of art you know art philosophy and and it's interesting sometimes when you think about the way things change and the way things move in terms of what's right and what's wrong and and it's quite political and it's quite controversial and then it's also not it's also completely you know just beautiful and lovely so it, it can be anything it's quite thing is is it's the whole thing's full of contradiction and hypocrisy but it's also <laughs> full of beauty and wonder wonder so it's that's why i love it i mean i really could nerd out here for i could do a 15 hour podcast and you won't get a word in <laughs> i'd really enjoy that <laughs> oh. I'd I'd subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> no i love it um, but you've also run uh, life drawing sessions. I think you mentioned that you've been in the store before yeah, doing yeah. work with other exhibitions. So how do you, is that is that a way of kind of introducing people in the community to what's in the collections or? Yeah, I mean, we do sessions in the galleries as much as possible uh, because, I mean, students are encouraged to go into so again copying is a big thing oh i mustn't copy you mustn't copy and i'm like no no you must copy copy away go mad go nuts steal everything you that's <laughs> it's great and when you get people in the galleries and you get them to to draw what they see or maybe do their own version it's a little bit like in music if someone does a remix everyone's like oh wow that's amazing if you do that in art you're stealing other people's ideas and it's like no 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 the the best steal really and and it you can learn so much about the process through deconstructing works in a gallery so you can look at a piece of art and you can think wow that's amazing the, i one of my favorite pieces of art and it, and this is what i talk about when we do the gallery exhibitions is jura's the hair and it's a watercolor piece of a hair and it was i can't remember what year it was um but it's an amazing it makes me want to vomit almost it's so good and it was, <laughs> <laughs> i know but well, every you, artist can aspire yeah. towards making someone vomit <laughs> With jealousy, with jealousy. <laughs> the, th the thing is with it is, is it's when you think when it was made and the tools that were open to the guy, I mean, don't get me wrong, he was just insanely talented. But if you think of the challenges and it, and I, I would struggle with every single tool known to man to be able to replicate that 500 years later. So it, it just, it befuddles my head. But one of the nice things about the hair is you can see the process quite well. You can see how he's broken it down, where he started, how he's, you know, he's put it into sections and da da da. So when we're in the gallery, that's what we like to do. And the collect the exhibition, oh, the one you did after the lockdown. Um, it was called What's Change. Yes, yeah, and we that showed was, lots of different oh, collections. I mean, I there. love that. That was like, I mean, that was like being at the here at the at the resource centre. It was lost. It was wonderful the way the works were put on display, because and we could get right in there. <laughs> I think that's often like the most popular exhibitions that we have, are where there's a whole range of different styles and artworks on display. It's not. I mean, obviously, when there's one artist and you can like really delve into their their techniques and their style that's one thing but people just love a bit of variety don't they yeah i think i think for i mean from a teaching perspective um i mean it's lovely to go and see like one one style or whatnot but um it's i do like like you say i do like a plethora of choice and and that is very much how i am as an artist i don't but i i i, I like to think of myself as the ringo star of artists so i <laughs> i play for the record you know and i i don't have a style i can't i can't paint i i find 
going to exhibitions quite challenging for me because it's like it's lots of things that look slightly different but the same in a room there's like 15 versions and everything looks slightly the same and i'm like meh whereas when i have got 800 things happening old you know it i like that it makes me happy and so I will grab huge amounts of pencils and drag everyone upstairs. And But then the guys, they love going into the gallery and doing the work. And it's one of the most popular sessions in terms of like having having people attend. So it's just good fun. And, and I do think that the relationship that the community has with Touchstones is, is vital in terms of being able to access being able to find the pleasure in in the you know we're so lucky to have a collection we're so lucky to be able to to engage with it and to be able to use it to to make ourselves feel nice which is exactly what we do so the the sessions are there to make people feel well and and the collections form part of that wellness so it's it's lovely um and like the football art prize as well that was that was really good that was really well received in fact we had some it was it was interesting as well because there were some more modern pieces um and so we had some discussions about what is our you know what makes and it was really <laughs> i remember brian did a tour and and someone did question didn't you know we yeah. had a really and that carried on then which over a few sessions we spoke about what makes art and and it's interesting to be able to showcase other styles of art and also to say, to help people understand that it doesn't have to be a canvas, it doesn't have to be paint, you know, it can be, it can be whatever you want, you know, especially, it's funny as well with the, um, with the votive. Uh, the uh, Grace and Perry. The, mm. There was one image of the um, the car where the car crash had happened, and there was the the lady standing over, and that reminded me of a votive. So again, we spoke about that during some of the sessions. So you've got all these lovely ways of bringing in massive art themes via mm. the collection. I mean, Grace and Perry is another one that likes to mix it up, doesn't he? Oh Some yeah. Thing. Lots of references. Yeah, lots of references, lots of different styles. Jay, I, my favourite thing was Jacob. I took my son to see the Grace and Perry and he sort of saw it as a whodunit. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really interesting. He was telling me what was happening. Like it was, he sort of did it as like a crime story. It was really, so I really enjoyed that. Well, I mean, Grace and Perry, he's fantastic. And again, we were, it was dead exciting to, to be able to be in the gallery and doing a session amongst the artwork of one of the leading um artists in the country so you know put that in your cv sort of <laughs> <laughs> no it's great so yeah um erica i know you spoke about like some of the barriers that people face yeah. in terms of like social isolation i can never say that social isolation it is a mouthful it is isn't it yeah um but i was just thinking about future projects we've been talking about um you know, whilst our building's closed to the public, having sessions here at the yeah. store. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want to talk a bit about your ideas for that? Yeah, and... sure. So one of the things that came out, at, well, actually, it's from the work we've been doing in Touchstones and elsewhere. So we've done some work in independent living complexes where we go in and work with people. And we talk about, um, you know, when we do art and we do the sessions, however, you will always, there are always people who, for them, social isolation has tipped to a point where I was in a way where it's really hard to leave the house. You get to a point where it, it's just not going to happen. You're just terrified. So the idea is here is to work with a group. So we're going to be working with, hopefully, Rochdale Healthcare Alliance as um, we're going to make referrals for people. And then we're going to work with um, a psychologist and an artist and three artists over nine weeks using different mediums. Um, so everyone's very much supported. It's um, and very much um, both artistically and, and in terms of um, the isolation. And we're going to pick items from the, ex from the collection uh, and then create pieces of art based on their 
on how that makes people feel so it could be obviously something very much related so they could do an image of the thing or it could be around so it doesn't have to be again it doesn't have to be a classical tradition it could be something more abstract or something more figurative and i think introducing different mediums different materials mixed um mixed materials would be a really nice idea um and i oddly enough yesterday i was speaking to one of the artists i'm hoping to work with um and we were getting very excited about the whole thing and then the idea is is after the nine weeks we would be able to then introduce the people to the the other groups and hopefully then we can sort of help them sort of keep that going and and get that get that i um socialization and and also uh, using art as a coping mechanism, as a as a tool and a strategy for for managing anxiety. So, yeah, so we're doing that. I mean, there's an odd, I had a conversation today. I have this idea to do a session around. Um, so Rochdale, one of the uh, health strategies, there's an issue with old people having falls at home and trip hazards and and all sorts of things being a, um, a a reason for that so i have an idea of doing an art art sessions to help people uh, learn how to avoid trip hazards and but the thing is is a lot of the time when people go on these courses that teach them about health they're very boring mm -hmm. they're very sterile and you're all sat in a room watching a powerpoint presentation praying for lunch and um <laughs> <laughs> you know of what I speak. you know what I mean it's yeah. just like ah so and I find if someone's talking to me if I'm doing art while I'm doing if I'm doing art then I I tend to be more engaged actually with the topic because I'm my hands are busy and if my hands are busy then I'm listening if my hands aren't busy I'm fidgeting and I'm I'm thinking about cake so um yeah that's so I have loads of loads of things along that line and the, and the thing is is in terms of health the health strategy for Rochdale there's so many different things we could do so it's um, very exciting I'm just getting like, I actually got a bit emotional when you were talking then because I just think it's a beautiful thing like I, I just wish there was more of this in the world really and I, I, I think it's great that there's so much of it happening in Rochdale because it makes me proud to work here yeah but, there um, is yeah. I had a meeting with Becky from Cartwheels on Monday cartwheel arts yeah yeah, yeah cartwheel arts and 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 again it, you know just they're doing some amazing stuff and then there's like uh, I know at mine they do some amazing stuff and there are loads and loads and loads of art groups now and and the thing is as well is I actively um promote other people's groups because and someone said to me once you shouldn't do that you know and i'm like well there's at least forty thousand people aged over 60 living in rochdale so with the best will in the world <laughs> you know um and you can't cater for all no of them. <laughs> that's right and and i think it's healthy for people to get different different perspectives you mm. know and also i think it's healthy for sometimes i worry about the working in silos as well so you know so we carve everyone up into labels and and that i, I concerns me i like i like there to be uh, lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds who have had different life experiences and 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 you are amazed by the differences but you're comforted by the similarities you know so you get that kind of vibe going in in a in a session and we're really lucky as well i have to say i think our groups we do we try and cater for everybody um and it's and they're good fun so but yeah i agree rochdale's rochdale's happening man <laughs> <laughs> it really is that's why we're doing this <laughs> yeah it's good it's good i love being here and and you know i'm from cornwall and everyone's an artist in cornwall everybody my uncle my i always remember my uncle my uncle was fun like he was an archetypal cornish artist that he would um go on the beach do a load of like uh, and he was like newland school style he'd take them to the gallery they'd give him some money he'd get really really drunk for five days and then he'd just <laughs> do that cycle all over again and that's like my archetypal cornish artist and but in up north it's it's all it's very different art is used very it's interesting to me the the different differentiation it's 
dare I say it, a lot more working class up north as well. In the south, it tends to be very, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's the art world is what it is, and I still think it's very middle class, darling. But um, I think there's a lot more opportunities in the north for artists of, of all walks of life. And that's one thing that Rochdale champions. I mean, you know, the exhibition now, mm. that's banging on really of, of of where Rochdale is it's about challenging the the status quo about asking the questions about encouraging people who don't have a voice who don't have access and opportunity to you know art is horrifically middle class really you know I've read this fantastic thing the other day about this guy great artist but it was like I didn't really understand what was special and different and then I read his backstory and he was like a chief exec of a, of a very, very luxury car company. And I thought, ah. So that's what's special about him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eric, meow. <laughs> Sorcerer milk. But it is that kind of, I, I like the idea of, of, of outsider art. I'm, I'm a big fan of that, really. So, yeah. And, and I like the, the collection, the, the exhibition at the moment is, is oh, absolutely melts my face yeah it's beautiful it is erica beautiful. i could listen to you for years ah. and years um, yeah i sort of want you to be my best mate now yeah. <laughs> oh no honestly you get i'm tiresome after a couple of hours <laughs> no i think i think i've spent more than two hours with you and i'm not that bored so um erica like, when we were talking about um art making you feel better so mm. like i was saying i did cross stitch and it's really helps with my anxiety and stuff like that how what are the other kind of mental health benefits well-being benefits from doing what you do uh i think it's on a on base on a very basic level it it does help aid in people feeling calm giving people space um helping them to focus helping people with concentration uh helping people with their confidence and their awareness what i will also say that i think is really integral with the way we structure the sessions is it's about decision making and choice so one of the things with art is is and again i i said it mentioned about this earlier about people being you know you paint like katie i paint like erica and it's allowing people to be in control for that whole two hours of that piece of work no one else is making decisions for them no one's telling them what to do no one's telling them the decisions they're making of wrong or right those decisions just are and that's great that's that's exactly as it should be so it gives people a chance to be in control and that gives them the confidence and then the process becomes um, familiar and that process of being in control becomes familiar and then it sort of starts to permeate outside of the room so people then feel more confident in other areas also the idea of using new materials when we do something for the first time that we've never done a lot of the time our, we feel uncomfortable and we don't like that feeling and we call that bad oh it's bad i don't like the way it makes me feel and it's this i i kind of bang on with people that bad is different and it once you do something more than like four times it's no longer different it's the same because you're doing it again so if we're doing a medium that people feel uncomfortable with i kind of reintroduce it and reintroduce it and in the end they are comfortable with it because they've done it again and it's about repetition and it's okay repetition is a really helpful tool with dealing with anxiety another thing is so we we do lots of sessions around doodling because when we doodle one of the things i noticed with jacob with the autism is that he will get me to repeat things again and again and again and again and i once asked the um consultant i was like what what's that about and he said that you he's trying to relive an emotion and that's what he's trying to recreate that feeling of joy and when i doodle so when i'm doodling my brian woods faces when i doodle that brings me joy i'm comfortable in that space and i'm controlling that space so at the groups what i say to people is imagine you're on the phone and someone's talking at you and you are doodling and just start doing that and it, you just watch people go off into this like blurry heavenly bliss of 
doing their own thing and feeling so it, it really helps people to to understand where how they can create their own space and also i do bang on about if you're at home just take 15 minutes just do a little bit of doodling and it'll turn into three hours before you know it you know no one gets fed but that's fine because <laughs> you're in a good place i do one session that i love and it's called i've stolen it it's called learn how to draw with the right hand side of your brain and we use um there's a portrait that pablo picasso did of stravinsky and it's an awful thing he's all his head's too small his shoulders are all <laughs> wobbly his legs it reminds me a little bit of um lucy in the sky with diamonds or something like that you know it's like this big wobbly bobbly weird portrait and it's just a line drawing and what i do is i try and get people to replicate that and it's awful because you can't because the proportions are all messed up. And then what I do is I get them to turn it upside down and cover up three quarters of it and just draw the lines. And I always remember I was doing this session and this one lady came in and she was so angry. It was someone was working with and she's got a cancer diagnosis and everything had gone wrong that week. She was like ready to kill a man. You know, she was so, so angry. And we started doing the session and she was like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it? She was really, really, this is silly. Why are we doing this? And then as we got into it and we, we did the second part of the exercise and we, you do, you, what you do is you do an exact copy of the lines. You don't think about any of the rules of law, of art. You just copy the lines and then you turn it around and do it again and do it again and when she peeled off the last and she uncovered her drawing I'll never forget her face she was like oh, that's magic and she was dead excited and and her shoulders dropped and her and she just was really calm and dead happy and chatty and having a lovely time and at the end of the session she came up to be dead quiet and she went that was the best session you've ever done that was <laughs> and she sort of and I thought actually no it was the best session you've ever done yeah. <laughs> you know it was like this lovely you could see it working and I think art can when you practice art as a tool or a strategy for overcoming and I mean low level you know if people uh, I did I actually did toy with the idea of um, going and doing a uh, master's in um, art uh, doodah. <laughs> therapy. Art, art therapy. therapy. Yeah, yeah, I did I did look at it and I went to speak to some people and, and sort of started on that process. But actually, I've, I prefer doing it at this level. I think you can help people with like low-level anxiety just to come up with some strategies and to really um, change things. And then the idea is, is if we're working with people who need a bit more support and a bit more help, then I'll pay an art therapist <laughs> to come and work for me and do it that way instead. And the great, the great thing is about that as well, a lot of the time these are people that wouldn't think that their problems are bad enough to go and find help, so they'll just sit there and suffer in silence. Yeah. So what yeah. you're doing is making them more aware as well of of what they can do to help and that they, they you know, are the worth. other thing we do though is it's not just about the health and so it's health and well-being so i make i work very closely with the carers hub and through the touchstone sessions i've probably made i reckon at least half a dozen or more referrals to the carers hub i've helped people get access to um housing benefit we help people get access to any kind of support needs so advocacy with healthcare so we work with health watch um, they've come into the sessions um rbh all of these different local organizations i i network avidly with action together um with via the grassroots gatherings on a friday and make sure i know what's available and what's out there for people so it's not just about health per se it's also about other things because one of the issues with over 60s is unless you've got a particular label of maybe it's a long-term health maybe it's a how you know you don't know people don't know where to go to get support so it's an it's we do we're trying to sort of do more of that and we're um, going to be taking volunteers on soon as well to support us in the sessions and lots of people who do the um, sessions are interested in volunteering and we also have recently got 
to a new board member and that person is someone who attends the touchstone group and they're really interested oh, in yeah so it's and it's really that part of it's very important to me as well that you know the the with the steering groups and everything we do how how creative health runs as an organization comes from the groups themselves and and i you know i to be honest it makes your life easier because then i've got to think because they tell me what to do <laughs> 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 so yeah there's there's lots of straw there's lots of you know lots of different aspects to it so yeah as our building's currently closed for redevel the reval redel redel um what what do you want to see in the spaces when we reopen what would you love to see happen in there well brian i don't like to be selfish <laughs> as you know but uh yeah for me what i want is i want the gallery to be about three foot by three foot and i want the rest of the place to be just tables and tables and tables and chairs where people can come and do art so that i mean no i'm playing but that for me is is the dream is would be to have a space where we can non right so i'm going to tell you exactly this is exactly what you need to do okay non-slip flooring sinks everywhere so we've got lots of places to wash things um nice tables and chairs and and that's basically it that's what i want i need a room so much in rochdale i need a room where because at the moment because we use a lot of venues you've got to be really careful about what materials you use because you can't be messy um and I don't mean, I mean, obviously we tidy up after ourselves, but it'd be nice to have an area where we could properly go to town. You know, there's, there's so many materials we're restricted from using because we can't tidy up because we don't have the facilities. We don't have enough sinks, basically, and mops and things like that. And it'd be great, you know, like um, I'd love to do some work with like resin, with more sort of... Um, like with paint but in a much more splattery and dirty and messy way mm -hmm. that we, at the moment we've got to be really controlled in in what we do i want to be able to let people let go a bit you know and if the space enabled us to enable people to properly go to town on that would be so cool i would love that well we're just gonna get on the phone to the architects yeah. and builders now yeah have to drop the plans start yeah, yeah. again <laughs> messy space <laughs> messy noted. space that's fine <laughs> but i mean in terms of the i mean the gallery i know i've, I've i think i've someone said somewhere that there's going to be a theater yeah. or that kind of a thing live performance space performance space and um but i mean for me it's the gallery as well so so enough room that we can get in there get the chairs in get everyone in doing drawing and and Do some sessions duly noted mm. yeah 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 so make it so yeah <laughs> I will make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks so much for for joining us for our for our Touchstones Tapes podcast today, Erica. Um, it's been really fascinating to learn more about your work and why you started it and your passion for it. It's really inspiring. Oh. We, we look forward to your upcoming 15 hour podcast yeah yeah it's, it's a, uh, well you know it's on the cards any day now I'll get that call. Well, that was such a brilliant conversation. I was not exaggerating when I said that I got emotional. I think it was just hearing that Erica trained as an artist and could have gone down that traditional route of, you know, being a working artist, making her own work and selling her own work, but instead has used it to make life better for other people. Um, I just found it really like selfless and, and touching that she's, she's doing that with her life. I agree, Katie. Um, I was really like touched by the fact that um, working class artists in the borough are getting that opportunity to, to make work that really addresses the health inequalities um, and when she was talking about um, sort of the north and south divide and how um, here in the north we're, we're doing lots of work to, to support people and support their health and well-being through the arts um, it's really refreshing to see that artists are, are passionate about that and that 
you know, this this is helping the borough to thrive and be a better place for everyone. Just an all round inspiring episode, really. But um, that is it for this month's episode. And we'll be back again next month. But uh, for now, it's back to you in the studio, Rick. Wow, what a conversation. What an episode. Erica is an amazing person, isn't she? Thank you for all the work you've done with us at Touchdowns, Erica, if you're listening. We're really looking forward to working with you again in our shiny new building. But for now, that's it from us on the Touchdowns tapes this month. We'll be back next month with a new episode as always. Thank you so much for listening and to Audio Always, the production company who have helped us make this podcast. Don't forget to follow and subscribe to the Touchstones Tapes and whatever app you use to listen to your podcasts. And follow us on the socials. We're at touchstones underscore Rochdale on Instagram and search touchstones on Facebook. I'm off to enjoy the sunshine. Bye.